That is Why is it like body. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, we bring a lot of early stage, high-end sensors. People who can afford the high-end more quantity. So most of our users are engineers.
same thing.
Can you hear me? So welcome. I hate to break up the great drinks and uh, socializing, but we're going to get back to this in a second. So hold your conversations, and, and it's, it's great. I mean, I, I've had some wonderful conversations too, but um, we're going to get started with a brief program. And uh, my name is Matt Marshall, uh, founder and CEO of VentureBeat. Welcome to Blueprint 2018. This is the event about how to create higher paying jobs in the heartland, and why it's in the tech industry's interest to do so. Uh, so I think we have, um, I don't know if we had the, the housekeeping, uh, Blueprint, uh, is, is Blueprint 2018 is the hashtag for Twitter. Uh, we are going to be live streaming this. Uh, the main program starts tomorrow, so the, the bread and, and butter, if you will. So tonight, it's going to be pretty light. It's going to be about cu culture and, and fun. And it turns out that, uh, you know, in, in our view, uh, culture and fun make up a critical ingredient of the recipe for aspiring regions. Um, and we're going to be hearing some stories today about how, how that conversation around dynamism and, and creativity is helping, helping those regions, right? So stop the presses. Reno's not all about gambling, okay? Just in, just in case. There's a, lot, there's a wide group of folks that are coming from outside. I met Jakob from Copenhagen uh, today during the Tesla tour, who actually uh, w was, was, was just fascinated with being, staying at the El Dorado and seeing the, the transformation happening around him. Um, but you know, there's, this, there's this group thinking, too, that people are starting to talk about in Silicon Valley. And this is where I spent the last decade creating VentureBeat and, and writing about it. Um, and I think there's an there's pe actual people leaving Silicon Valley now in, in, in greater numbers. And I think there's a great opportunity for regions to take advantage, stepping up and showing your own regional strength. So we're going to get started with those, uh, those conversations. We're going to hit on three areas. So the first is going to start with the museum. And, and, and they're hosting us. And we're going to be hearing from the gentleman who's, who's, who's going to talk about how all this came together. Second conversation is about... Uh, to, uh, is a conversation between two mayors from unique communities that are remaking themselves through art and culture. And then the third is from a chef, a hyper-creative chef who shunned the big city to come and, and seek his f fame and fortune in the smaller city. And so uh, looking forward to that conversation too. So without further ado, let's get started. Are you, are you guys ready for the, the start? Yes. So uh, we are going to, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce the curator, the founder, uh, executive director, and CEO of the, the Museum of Art here. Uh, he uh, built it from ground up, brick by brick, uh, and there's been uh, some, some fabulous collections. I'm, I'm hearing that they're actually available for you to see from six, uh, I think, believe it, from five, six to seven. So we want to keep it short so you can actually get out and see some, some of it. Fabulous collections, and you'll see that they do inform us of art and, and, and kind of foster creativity. So please welcome David Walker. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, David. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Good. I'm wired. Feels good. Feels good to be wired. Um, so I am David Walker. Um, I, I, I'm not the founder of the museum because we actually we were founded during the Great Depression in 1931. So... But what you see is um, some of the fruits of, uh, of, of, of the work that we've been doing the last couple of years. I want to thank uh, museum trustee 
Heather Goldman, who's here somewhere. Where are you, Heather? Raise your hand. There you are over there. Yeah, Heather and, and her good buddy, uh, Robert Goldberg, who's here. Thank you guys so much for having the vision to do this, uh, this, this great event here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Um, I'm thrilled um, that you're here tonight, and uh, I'd like to share a short presentation with you. When I say short, it's going to be about 15 minutes. Uh, it's, it's sort of a Nevada 101 presentation, and I think you'll see that looking into our past uh, will help inspire some of the conversations that you're going to be having uh, over the next day and a half. So um, that's what this is all about. And let me see if I can work this thing. Am I up? Good, good. Okay. Well, the world often sees Nevada as an empty, desolate, rural, or marginal uh, sp a place. Uh, this is a, a photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan. Uh, his images seared Nevada's image as an exotic, mysterious, and otherworldly place uh, into 19th century America and Europe collective consciousness. And for many, this still exists today. We see Nevada, its geography, cultures, and industries as a place that informs everything that we do at this museum. We honor the history at this place every day because the story of Nevada resonates globally, perhaps more than ever today, uh, which is why you are here gathering uh, with us uh, our building, designed by architect Will Bruder, reflects our dramatic geography and took its cues from the Black Rock Range a few hours north of Reno. As you will soon understand, we are not your typical art museum. In fact, our mission statement reads, we are a museum of ideas. People gravitate to extreme environments like Nevada to experiment, test, and take risks. There are fewer rules here, and it's easier to realize the unthinkable. Between 1951 and 1992, just 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, the U.S. Department of Energy tested 928 nuclear devices, which included nearly 100 above-ground tests and over 800 underground tests resulting in craters such as this that still exist out in our landscape. It ain't pretty, is it? Um, most of these images in this presentation that I'm sharing with you tonight are from the museum's signature altered landscape collection. It's more than 2,000 photographs that really document how man has altered the landscape uh, that we live in, mostly in the United States. So I just wanted to put that out there. Many don't realize that 85% of Nevada is managed by the federal government. It's Bureau of Land Management land. Uh, this is tricky. But it's also good. Uh, access to federally managed public lands means that large-scale mining operations owned primarily by multinational corporations dot the entire landscape. These companies extract a range of minerals and metals from copper to gypsum to gold to silver, and then export them around the world. This image depicts Virginia City in the mid-1980s, Comstock silver mining. It shows not only the mining operations, but also instant cities that sprung up overnight during this time. Nevada's frontier cycles of boom to bust are profound cautionary tales. This aerial image by David Mizell, who is also an artist in our Ultra Landscape collection, depicts the American mine, uh, the, the Carlin Gold Mine in Nevada, an open pit gold mine just four hours north of Nevada, near Elko. And there are two more images of that extraordinary mine. Lithium. Nevada is also home to the only operating lithium mine in the United States, and this is about three hours uh, from Reno. This is a photograph staged by New York-based artist David Benjamin, who the museum commissioned in 2011 as part of an exhibition called Landscape Futures. Benjamin undertook a project called the Gray Rush that drew a parallel between California's iconic gold rush of the 19th century and what lithium mining could mean to Nevada in the future. 
In Nevada, water is scarce. We live in a desert. Large-scale water reclamation projects to divert water resources away from their natural flows to areas of population growth and settlement were required. The story of water in southern Nevada is similar, where the Colorado River, diverted by the construction of the Boulder Dam, at the time it was completed in 1936, it held the record as the tallest dam in the world. Today known as the Hoover Dam, it provides nearly 18 million people in Arizona, California, and Nevada and water. And what, will we, what do we do with that in uh, uh, Las Vegas? <laughs> this is also another photograph from the Alter Landscape Collection, Canadian artist Edward Patinsky from his water series. Closer to home, uh, about an hour north of here, is what used to be the, Winneb the Winnemucca Lake. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, right off the, uh, the, the, the Paiute uh, Indian uh, tribe of land, uh, native land. Uh, this was a real lake. Uh, water was, was uh, uh, diverted from this lake. The BLM took it over. And uh, this is what it looks like today. It's a playa. It's a dry lake bed. And in 2011, we commissioned Chris Drury, uh, 2009 actually, a British artist, a very famous uh, land artist to come, uh, who took great interest in this uh, story. And he created a 300-foot diameter drawing uh, of a Native American weaving design. And this has come to represent or symbolic or be symbolic for uh, the, w the land that was taken away from our Native peoples and um, uh, uh, taken over by the federal government. Uh, very important piece, and we're very proud to have produced this piece. Daniel McCormick, Mary O'Brien, create these 360-foot-long uh, reed water sculptures, uh, also the Truckee River and also the Carson River. Uh, the Army Corps uh, uh, of Engineers came in and diverted uh, waters to places where it should not have gone, created a lot of problems. These artists came in, we commissioned them in partnership with the Nature Cons Conservancy and created these wonderful sculptures that are now allowing the river to uh, uh, go back and, and, and become part of its, of, of its original natural flow. These will actually disappear uh, over time. So we call this art that walks in the world. A lot of what we do at this museum uh, is, is activist art, and this is a part of that. 5% of Nevada is under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, what you're looking at here is the Wendover Army Air Base, active from 1942 to 1969, conceived as a heavy bombardment training base during World War II. You're looking at the hangar that once housed the Enola Gay, the aircraft that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. In 1952, the military began testing high explosive bombs on an enormous expanse of public land near Fallon, Nevada, which is only about an hour away from us. When the international art world considers Nevada, it is because we are the birthplace of land art. Some of the 20th century's most celebrated artists have created work here. In 1962, Swiss artist Gene Tingley staged his own explosive large-scale performance study for an end of the world, and this was just 10 miles south of Las Vegas on the Gene Dry Lake. It was also a call to humanity to consider the broader implications of, an on, uh, of its ongoing nuclear pursuits. Michael Heiser, uh, who lives in New York now, but is a Nevadan and whose father was an archaeologist here uh, in Nevada, created one of the first large-scale drawings on the Gene Dry Lake, uh, uh, just, just south of Las Vegas, Nevada. He did this with motorcycles, by the way. Double negative, the Mormon Mesa, just north of Las Vegas. Uh, two large uh, trenches that were carved out uh, of the Mesa, uh, di displacing 250,000 tons of earth and rock. Very famous piece. And this is Michael Heiser's most recent piece. This is the crew de da, the crew, the crew de da, is that the word? Crew de da, something like that. I'm, I've had two glasses of wine, sorry. 
I shouldn't have done that, especially in the, with this audience. Crudita. This is a mile and a half long, and it's a quarter mile wide. And this is a sculpture. It's the largest sculpture on the planet. And he's been working on this for 40 years. And uh, recently we worked with Senator Harry Reid and others in Washington uh, to make 800,000 acres around this project, the Basin and Range National Park, uh, guaranteeing, hopefully guaranteeing, that we won't see mining and, 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 and urban development uh, around this amazing project. Uh, you don't get to see it now, but you might get to see it in 10 years. In 2012, the Swiss artist Ugo Rondinoni came to see us. He had a vision for a project he wanted to do in Nevada. He didn't know exactly where. And of course, he picked a BLM site. <laughs> That's okay. We worked through that. We have a very good law firm, by the way, McDonald Carano next door. <laughs> And they do everything in kind for us, so we're very lucky. Uh, but this is the artist. Uh, he's a troublemaker. Uh, but he created a piece called Seven Magic Mountains, and we produced it. Uh, it was a $3.5 million project, opened in 2016. Uh, it's about 10 miles south of Las Vegas, right next to the Jean Dry Lake, where some of these other famous historical land art projects uh, were realized back in the 60s. Uh, each one of these totems is about 35 feet tall, and each boulder is 40 to 60 tons each. Uh, it was designed to be a two-year project. You can see some of the work. We got Las Vegas Paving Corporation, did all the work for us. It was fantastic. We see about 1,000 people a day who come from all over the world to see this project. It's been so popular. So we are now working with the BLM, Clark County, our donors, uh, and it looks like we're going to extend this project for another 20 years, perhaps another 100 years. So we're very proud of it. It's a very, very popular project. Can you say sixteen? Hmm? Ten miles out of Vegas? Mm hmm Maybe 15. I lied. <laughs> 10 or 15, you know. Yeah, Just don't be in a rush. Just don't be in a rush. Okay, so this is the museum, right? Um, we were founded during the Great Depression, 1931. Um, we're the only accredited art museum in the state of Nevada. And I think you already get the sense that our priority is to serve the northern Nevada region. Reno, of course, Tahoe. But we work around, but we work around the state. Um, it's a great museum. It was... Um, as you know, it was inspired uh, by, by the great, uh, the, the rock formation in, in, uh, north of here. Uh, what we have here that is very unique is we have a research center. It's called the Center for Art and Environment. And we look at how artists creatively interact with natural built and virtual environments here. We have archive materials from more than 1,000 artists from all seven continents uh, that, that deal with this. Uh, we have people who come from all over the world, students, scholars, writers, to come and study uh, the archives here at this museum. Michael Heiser, Walter D. Maria, Center for Land Use and Interpretation, the list goes on and on. This is Lita Albuquerque. This is a major project she did in Antarctica called Stellar Access. Uh, we have this archive, an extreme environment. We occasionally do exhibitions. Uh, these are the kinds of materials people come and see and write about and study when they're writing books. Uh, about whatever it is they're writing books about. So this museum attracts a lot of international traffic because of the research center here at the museum. Okay, now this is a guy named Dr. James Church. He was a University of Nevada Reno professor. He was a scientist, a humanist, and a lover of the arts. Uh, and he established the first snow station on the top of Mount Rose. And if you could see earlier, the tallest peak out here you could see from our museum is Mount Rose. Uh, and that's where this uh, first uh, snow station was, was uh, established. Um, it was established to measure the water, water content in snow. Uh, and then he began tracking fluctuating levels over time, which helped to establish the field of climate science, which gave rise to the study of climate change. Dr. James Church also happened to be the founder of this museum. So from our very beginning, the concept of art and environment has been central to our mission. What a cool founder, huh? 
Now, this is a photograph that he took from Mount Rose uh, of Lake Tahoe. Uh, we love this photograph. And in 2014, we commissioned the great architect and artist Maya Lin. Uh, she is the same person who designed the v Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, wall in Washington, D.C., and is a good friend of this museum. Uh, and this piece called My, uh, Cloud Line Mount Rose at 8,500 square feet uh, is a memorial to James Church and the founding of climate science. So um, we're very, very pleased to have this here. For those of you who are new to the area, Lake Tahoe is right over the hills. It's a 45-minute drive. It's the largest alpine lake in North America. It's beautiful, isn't it? Not all of us can afford to have a home on the shore of Lake Tahoe, but we aspire to that. <laughs> the outflow of Lake Tahoe is the Truckee River, and it's a 121-mile river. It's the most litiga litigated uh, body of water uh, in the United States. It comes right through downtown Reno. We get a lot of our water uh, from this great river. And it ends in the desert north of here. It actually runs north. It's quite interesting. And it ends in the desert. Uh, it ends on the Paiute Indian Reservation and at a place called Pi uh, Pyramid Lake. Isn't that beautiful? And that lake is almost as big as Lake Tahoe. So that's where all that water goes. It also happens to be very near Black Rock City, which is where the great Burning Man event happens every year. There's 70,000 people who have come from all over the world to celebrate and make art and collaborate uh, just, just right near Reno. You, anybody been to Burning Man? A few of you? Okay, well, by the end of this evening, I think I'm going to convince most of you, you better go. Uh, Elon Musk goes. The Google guys go. A lot of other guys go. Um, I go sometimes. I'm on the board, so I have to go, but uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, recently, Burning Man became a nonprofit. It was a, an LLC for many years, uh, and it became a nonprofit. And one of the first uh, things that happened was we acquired the great 4,000-acre uh, fly ranch. And this, these are beautiful 104-degree waters that spurt out of this formation and uh, this is going to be the future year-round home for Burning Man. It's going to have a philosophic center, a lot of other things. It's not going to replace the event that happens every year. We want to keep it clean and pristine and beautiful. We have um, the Center for Art and Environment. We have a major archive collection. And uh, just a few months ago, for the first time ever, drawing on our special archive collection, we presented the remarkable story of how the legendary Nevada gathering evolved from humble countercultural roots in San Francisco's uh, Baker Beach into the world-famous desert convergence it is today. So never-before-seen photographs, artifacts, journals, sketches, and notebooks revealed how the temporary experimental desert city came to be and how it continues to evolve. We are happy that this exhibition just left the museum and is on its way to Washington, D.C., where it will be part of a large Burning Man exhibition at the Renwick Gallery uh, later this month. Okay, this is where it gets good. Pay attention. <laughs> Big ideas unfold in the desert. So it came as no surprise when artist and geographer Trevor Pagelin, a MacArthur Foundation fellow, approached the museum in 2015 to imagine the, uh, the unimaginable, to send a satellite sculpture into orbit. Along with Paglin, we are preparing to embark upon an exploration of the most extreme environment of them all, outer space. For more than half of his career, Paglin has been documenting classified military and security bases in the deserts of the American West, mostly in Nevada. These sites are so remote that Paglin employs high-powered telescopes to photograph these clandestine facilities. In fact, the title of his upcoming retrospective at the Smithsonian's American Art Museum this summer is titled Sites Unseen, which is a great title. Um, we are going to launch a project 
called Orbital Reflector. And if you saw that giant Mylar prototype in the atrium on your way up, now you know what that is. It's a very small version of what's going to go up on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in July or early August of this summer. Uh, it's, a, it's a major, major event. Um, it's not going up for military reasons. It's not going up for commercial reasons. It's purely an artistic gesture. And as Trevor likes to say, when we look up into the starry night sky, we tend to see reflections of ourselves. And that's what this project's about. It's going to go up on a rocket, shoot out. There's a CubeSat. That's a CubeSat, right? About the size of a brick, really. And then this big old thing opens up. A little CO2 cartridge fills it up. It gets real big. It's like a long, 100-foot-long diamond shape. And this bad boy is going to be seen during the evening, the naked eye. You're going to be able to look up and see it as it's zipping around the planet. Uh, we're going to develop STEAM education curriculum, lesson plans. We're going to engage the entire United States in a new educational agenda around STEAM. And I can't think of a better icon to STEAM education. For those of you who don't know what that is, we've been talking a lot about STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We think that's great, but we think you add art, the A, to that, suddenly it becomes interdisciplinary and becomes real. And we're not just about creating jobs anymore. We're about creating thought leaders and, and, and a sort of a new paradigm. And that's what this project's about. So we're very proud uh, of this project. I could tell you, we, most museums, art museums, hire art historians to run their education department, not at this museum. We hired a scientist. We have a renowned um, science educator here, Marissa Cooper. And uh, that has allowed us to get very serious about art and science. So this is our icon last week in this very space we held a conference, the Nevada STEAM Conference. 200 educators, K through 12 educators, came from all over the state of Nevada and actually from outside of Nevada to explore best practices of STEAM education. Uh, we were supported by the, uh, the Nevada Department of Education and also the Governor's STEM uh, Advisory Council. Uh, the idea is to inspire student creativity and foster innovation in our public schools. I'm almost done. Are we done? Okay. <laughs> this is kind of cute. Sorry, I got to... Trevor likes government patches, so he creates his own. Uh, and that's the patch that will go along with our, our project here. Um, okay, so when, when you, when you uh, take risk and you do things like this, um, you get a lot of attention. And that's what's been happening the last couple of years. Just the last 18 months, uh, these are some of the... Um, uh, some of the accoloids and, and, and media that we have uh, seen here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, now, we're very happy that you're all here today. And I think most of you know a lot about our proximity to the Silicon Valley, to the Bay Area. And, of course, you probably know a lot about uh, TRIC, the, the uh, uh, Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, uh, home to uh, Switch, Tesla, blockchain, Google, Across the road, Apple, and the list goes on and on. This is a very exciting moment for Nevada. This is a very exciting industry uh, and, and move forward for us. Uh, this is the uh, Tesla Gigafactory, almost done. And I think you find it interesting when you contrast it to the Michael Heiser project, right? Similar scale. Switch. Switch are, are the um, great company. Uh, Christy Overgaard's on the board. She's here tonight. Where's Christy? Say hi, Christy, wherever you are. Uh, Christy is also, um, and Switch, are the big underwriters, the big sponsors of our STEAM education programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Now, we're working with the Pritzker Prize-winning architect, Rome Coolhouse. We're currently in design feasibility and concept studies right now, and we're exploring possibilities uh, for expanding the museum outside this neighborhood. Uh, there we are looking at Trick. And those are concepts for what we're looking at right now. And I want to thank you very much for hearing this presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. David, great presentation.
Fascinating. So, uh, yep, okay, great. Um, so we have uh, two mayors coming to have a conversation uh, by themselves about this topic, art, uh, and anything else that's on their mind relationship in, in, in relation to tech and art creativity. Uh, so we have the mayor of, uh, of Reno, who is an entrepreneur in her own right. Uh, and you've probably heard the headlines. And for those of, th those of you who are not from Reno, it's you know, about 14% unemployment rate down to four. Uh, and the community's really come together to, to bring in all kinds of companies uh, ar around the time of, of her leadership. Um, and then uh, the uh, mayor of Gary, Indiana, who, uh, it, yeah, fir first uh, African-American uh, female mayor from Indiana. And that, was, that, that town was a, a community, was a, a, a bustling center for the steel industry, and then really struggled when that industry collapsed. And so they're both remaking their communities uh, through investments in art and culture. So please welcome Mayor Hillary Sheevy and, and Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Are we on? Are you're, we live? You're on? That we're means live. don't say swear words? That's, that's, well, you, can, that you, you can say swear words. 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> you, you got it. What's up 20 with 20 minutes. <laughs> Wait a minute. The last speaker got wine. What's up with that? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, before we start, um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome to Reno. We're excited to have you. <laughs> what did you think of our view? Yeah. It's Amazing. impressive, right? It's amazing. Right? Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Robert Goldberg. Where are you? Where are you? Are you hiding? He's hiding. He's very humble. But I want to say thank you so much. I know that this takes a lot of dedication, blood, sweat, and tears, and, and headaches. So thank you very much. And VentureBeat. Give a huge round of applause for VentureBeat. <laughs> Remarkable job. And if you're not following them on Twitter, you better be. They're all laughing. Yeah, Hillary, we're from tech. We, we follow him. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're really excited to be here. We're obviously, um, it, we are not Las Vegas, so what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? But in Reno, that's not the same situation here. I know everything that happens, so make sure you <laughs> behave yourself when you're here. I'm going to, we're just going to get right into this, but really quickly, I'm going to tell you, I wasn't a politician. I got into um, politics because I was very frustrated uh, with the city. They wanted to charge me $5,000 to move my sign two feet. So instead of complaining about it, I decided I would run for office. <laughs> Whoa! <That's amazing>. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing led for, to another, and um, then I decided to run for mayor because I really understood the challenges that businesses face when they come to governments. And I come from a long list of entrepreneurs and crazy in inventors. So I remember as a little girl, my mom always talking about how she would go and meet with this politician and they were really excited. She, would, she had really cool inventions, you know, fire prevention and things like that. So, um, so I remember as a little girl just, just looking up to her so much. So it's really kind of interesting today. But I, I remember the challenges that she faced. And I remember saying, one day I want to change mm -hmm. that. So for entrepreneurs and businesses, when they come to, um, to the city of Reno, it's really important for me to embrace them. I'm sure it's very similar for you. So why don't you tell us why you ran for office? I ran for office. Uh, first, I want to thank VentureBeat and the sponsors for the opportunity to come here. It's great to be with you, uh, Mayor Sheevy and uh, you know Mayor Hillary. That's what we... Call yeah, when each your other. name yeah. you can't spell it or yeah. yours is too long, you become <laughs> you mayor by first name. The first name it what makes about it Pete? easy. Yeah. Mayor Pete, right? Mayor Pete, Pete buddy yeah. guy. Because nobody know Mayor can Pete? say judge. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> exactly. So we'll just say say first names. And we actually met each other. At, we we're, did. We're at very New mayor involved school at, at New Harvard and IOP. That's that exactly the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Mm -hmm. But I um, grew up having access to. Mayor Richard Gordon Hatcher. And it had a real impact on me because I saw him helping people. And I saw him um, being accessible to young people. And so I said, I want to be a mayor when I grow up. I said that at seven. Uh-oh. <laughs> I said that at seven. You actually said that? I said <laughs> that at seven. 
but I took the securities route. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to Washington and did drug courts. I went to Indianapolis as the AG. I was a drug, uh, drug court judge in Gary. And, um, and I, you know, in retrospect, all of that was re preparing me to be the mayor of a city that had really had challenges. And so now, you know, I can go to Washington and I, I know where all the opportunities are and the different agencies. I can go to Indianapolis and have a rapport with folks even though we have a super majority of a different party from me. And, um, and I can think outside of the box. You know, what I always tell our team is, I don't want to hear what you can't do in government because, um, you know, anytime it starts sounding like government, I don't want to be involved in it. Oh, I love that. So, right? Um, so I always say we got to be the culture of yes. Yes, right? absolutely. Instead of the culture of no. And that can be really challenging, actually, in government. A lot of people have been there many years. There's a lot of great people that run, obviously, my city and your city, I'm sure. Absolutely. But I do think that that um, can be a challenge. They're not used to that culture of yes. They are not. In fact, um, sometimes uh, people, and, and we've seen this change in the city of Gary, but sometimes people get accustomed to just moving it off of their desk mm -hmm. or transferring it from their phone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I call that the runaround. I don't know what you guys yeah. call it in, in Reno, but we call it yeah. the runaround. We call it red tape, and, right? And that's not acceptable. And mm -hmm. so it's really how can you help someone get something done? Right. What do we need to do to make it happen? And the great news for me is that we have a lot of young people in our administration whose attitude is inherently that way. And so to be able to work with them and really learn from them, but also mentor them uh, has been a, a real treat for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, what I think is really interesting where there's been this pretty big shift, certainly with mayors, because mayors are at ground zero, right? Absolutely. Um, you can't just hide from people. Like if I'm in the grocery store, someone might be mad that I put a stoplight in their backyard or something. And crazy. they'll tell you about it. Right. And Even they tell though you're you, trying so to shop and get right. home to do something. <laughs> right. right. But these are people that are our friends, our brothers, our sisters, sure. people that um, you, you see at uh, little league games, things like Absolutely. that, right? But mayors are really at ground zero. And it's been, I would say, what do you think in the last two years, maybe? Mayors have come out very, very strong on many, many initiatives. And one of the things, you know, talking about the culture of yes and changing at the government level really has to be up to the mayor, right? You right. have to send, you have to send that energy, you have to send that vision, you have to send, um, you know, a, a different kind of message because it, it's something that's kind of new and shifting for government. Like many of you, um, this conversation is kind of actually happening all over the country right now with mayors and entrepreneurs and investors, and it's a really exciting time. And I can kind of tell you what would attract you. Obviously, we are now have become a medium-sized city, which I think is just so weird. When I go to conference of mayors, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Um, and what's also interesting, you guys will probably appreciate that, when I walk into the room, they say, oh, uh, Mayor Shivi, this was when I first was elected three years ago, they'd say, Oh, Mayor Shivi, Reno 911. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now always. when I walk in, they go, hey, Tesla mayor. <laughs> yeah, how about that? <laughs> right? That's cool. And so it is, it's a totally different narrative, but it's really interesting to see how cities like ours are playing a role in what you guys are doing across the country. It really is exciting. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits, obviously, um, coming from a smaller to medium-sized city, right? Sure. Sort of hospitality, the things you talk about. Well, the accessibility. I mean, Absolutely. getting things done quickly. You know, there's not a lot of red tape because as a motivated mayor, someone who wants companies, who wants new companies, new industry, um, we talked earlier, Matt talked earlier about the challenges that we had with manufacturing. And we're still the home of U.S. Steel's flagship but they don't employ 25,000 people anymore. They employ 3,500. And so what we've learned from that lesson is diversification. Mm -hmm. And so as a motivated city, we open our doors, we are welcoming, we want uh, folks to come and we want it to make it easier for them to come 
and we want to offer a trained workforce in that process. Right. Yep. Absolutely. It, it makes complete sense, right? But again, if you have a mayor that's sort of saying, you know, that's not what we want to be, and when you talk about diversifying, that's a lot like Reno. I mean, we were really known for this gaming hub, right? And sure. we've really diversified um, with, you know, different companies that have come here, uh, manufacturing, transportation, innovation, I mean, just uh, all across the board. And I think that's what cities are, have, are really learning, right? And the different infrastructure and the workforce that you're talking about. And it, it, it has to be, um, it's no different whenever you guys go into a store and you're treated poorly. Are you ever gonna go back there? It's the same thing when you walk in my door to City Hall and people will text me and you talk about the access, oh, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and my friends here know from Edon or um, Mike Kazmierski, there you go. Um, some of you guys will text me in the middle of the day and my, my schedule is just jam packed. I'm sure yours is. Oh sure. But I wanna be able to be accessible and meet um, so you text, yes. you accept emails, a anything you to know. bring to bring them into our city, but share this excitement, this energy that's happening about Reno. I don't know. Have, can you guys feel it yet since you've been here? <laughs> no, come on, come on, right, right. You can you can certainly feel well, it. Well, I have to commend you because I used to come to Reno to train at the Judicial College, and you know it was the bowling uh, right. capital. It was the Nugget, yeah, and it was, it was the, the Judicial nugget. College. Those were the three the things. The Nugget, which wasn't even in Reno, right? Exactly. Are you right. John and so wasn't in Sparks, even in Reno. In Sparks, right. exactly. Right. But as I walked down here today, I saw a totally new and different Reno. So you all yeah. are all to be commended. And it really uh, speaks to creating the quality of place, which we've worked hard to do. We're talking about arts and culture, uh, we were fortunate enough to win Bloomberg's uh, $1 million you won public that? art project. We oh, did. I'm so competitive. In Gary, I'm so competitive. Yes. And we, and, oh, we won. but congratulations. So, I love that. High five. Yeah. Love it. We That's got awesome. But art. I am, I am a sore loser. So you, Darn but it. you've got to look at it. Art house, uh, Theaster Gates, uh, world re renowned artists and, um, you know, what we did was, uh, even though the competition, the art uh, competition said, oh, you can do this place, it doesn't have to last, or you can do this public art piece, it doesn't have to last. I'm like, I'm not gonna spend a million dollars in Gary, Indiana, and not have something that lasts. That right. would be, you know, right. that would just crucify me on that one. Oh, and try so putting we a whale created, in your city. Exactly, so we, <laughs> exactly. Right. So we created a public art uh, culinary incubator. Mm -hmm. So the outside, uh, Art House, the social kitchen, is a beautiful uh, solar LED lights, uh, really nice place that lights yeah. up at night. And the inside is also a work of art, uh, artful bookcases, yeah. bar, but it's a gathering place for people to do both visual art as well as food art. And so we just had a cupcake war contest where the oh, winning <laughs> baker was able to provide food to our local casino to sell uh, their desserts. So that was something that yeah. was beneficial and it's really going to help us to drive something that we don't have, which are restaurants in the city. So it's yeah. really exciting. Yeah. But you know, you while you're trying to solve just the basic problems, do the garbage, Make sure that the snow is removed. That's uh, a big do, one. You know, do all of those things. You also have to do things that attract quality new of life, people right? and and give citizens who have stayed there a positive quality yeah. of life. So we're excited. Well, I'm on the same page with you for art. Art and culture is huge to me, and I always kind of I describe it in that um, arts are a way that you package your city. This is a way you would package a city. So yes. remember. Um, maybe the first thing that you were, um, when you got off at the airport and you saw a great art piece, yes. doesn't it make you sort of want to see what else is out there in mm -hmm. the city, right? Makes you want right? to explore. Yes, yeah. so exactly. exactly. It makes you want to explore. And so, um, and obviously for us, Burning Man is $70 million economic impact. I actually, um, I was just appointed 
to the chair for uh, the tapes committee at Conference of Mayors. So that stands for that's first big... woman in 25 years. How about that? So I'm super excited about All that. Right. But that's um, tourism, arts, parks, entertainment, and sports. Yes. And so I get to represent all mayors from across the country um, on, on all those things. That's a big so deal. So I'm kind of excited that I've been able to invite mayors for Burning Man. It should be really interesting, oh, right? That should be good. <laughs> that should be great. That and you be better great. be coming. Well, I'm going to do my best. You know, I. I <laughs> <laughs> It'll I be really interesting, I'm telling you. They're already all nervous, Only I can tell. Only if you can promise that I won't have the same baggage experience <laughs> that I had okay. today. And I feel horrible. I feel absolutely terrible. Mayor Karen's luggage did not get here. But if here you wanted me to afternoon. shop at your store, well, Mayor I, then I. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to have them delay my luggage. I would have gone to shop anyway. <laughs> you caught me. Well, you know, See? the good news is that this isn't a stuffy mayor crowd, right? Because uh, there's some folks that are dressed like I am, so I feel right at home here. I, have to, I think you look beautiful. But you're Thank smart you. because when I travel... I'm in you sweats, my hair is like yeah. crazy town. Well, it's unbelievable. So I did you're that the smart. first time out as mayor and saw way too many people. Yeah. So I decided that That's I, you know. That's actually a really good lesson. I'm not dressed up, but I mean. At hashtag least mayor made me do it. <laughs> right? Love that hashtag. I know, Love right? That hashtag. Right? Okay, so last but not least, like what's, what's your biggest challenge right now across the um, well, just tell me what's the biggest challenge you have right now in your city. You know, it would be easy for me to say that uh, the budget deficit and other standard the standard things, things, right? But it really is inspiring hope in residents. For so long, uh, they have had promises made to them by elected officials, and the promises have not been kept. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when I make a promise, I want to keep it. Yeah. And, uh, and we do, we historically do. Or we manage expectations. If, you know, I had someone email me about their driveway and they said, I, I sent you an email two years ago and you haven't fixed my driveway yet. I said, well, <laughs> if I fix my driveway, I'd be wearing a different color if I fix your driveway. But Here's the thing, I, you know, we do main streets and I explain to them the sequence of things because we've done a lot of paving, we've done a lot of infrastructure, but the other side of that is that I can see that people are now hopeful, they're embracing what we're doing right. because we, they expect us to do everything. So sure. they expect us to pave their driveway. Sure. But it really is uh, getting people to believe not just in government, but in the role they have in requiring yeah. and in, in instilling or requiring accountability in government and the role that they play in really being good citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't teach citizenship or really talk about citizenship in school anymore, but that really does matter. Mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you vote, making sure that you, you volunteer vote. in your community, making sure that right. others are okay, however you choose to do that. And you earlier talked about, you know, just mayors taking the lead. And we have by default been required to take the lead, but some of us, many of us embrace that lead. I know you do, I do, Mayor Landrew, yeah. you know, whether it's climate change, yeah. whether it's the issue of immigra immigration, immigration, whether it's yeah. ensuring that the we ACA. have common sense Right. Gun laws Guns, and yeah. the uh, Affordable Guns. Care Act. Yeah. Whatever we have to do, we do it because you're right. We're the ones who see the people in the pews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you see somebody at church mean mugging you because of something you mean haven't done. You. you know, now they're at church, <laughs> but, you know, you. They, do, <laughs> they do that. And <laughs> we're closest to it. It's, it's hard for them to get access sure. to a member of Congress or even the it president. Is. They can write a letter. But they can come right up to us right. and let them let us know how they feel. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, going back to what you were talking about, that a lot of promises were made to your citizens, sure. and and it kind of reminds me of hope. And yeah. and I think in some ways that's sort of what happened to Reno when we had this um, in, incredible shift. I, I, for those of the, you that don't know this. Um, Nevada was one of the highest uh, in foreclosures and unemployment next to Florida, and I kind of I think that. that 
being sort of branded with that and watching it sort of devastate, certainly I watched it devastate our city, sure. and people lost their jobs and their homes, and, and it, was, it was sort of constant. Um, but I think, you know, we, we started this little part of town that would not have happened if, um, you know, if, if times were good. Sure. And so we actually went to Landlords. It's this area of town. I hope you guys get to all visit it, uh, Midtown, while you're here. Has anyone been there yet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So anyway, um, but we were we were able to work with landlords, entrepreneurs, and artists to revitalize this whole part of town. And I That's think awesome. what it did was give people hope that something was happening. People could feel the energy. But today, that would never happen. You know, rents are starting to go up, and people sure. are starting to obviously go into business and, and things like that. But that's really sort of how it started. But we were really kind of telling the story of hope, and it was arts and culture and food and entertainment. And really, um, for me, focusing on arts was a, was a big deal, and I believe in it wholeheartedly. Um, economically absolutely and so I talk about this whale which I hope you guys all get to see because it's beautiful it's from Burning Man it lights up at night it's on our plaza uh, it is tremendous and I will tell you the hits I got um, that I took on social media were off the charts and so now I'm, I'm a big huge believer in save the whale campaign <laughs> All right, <laughs> but, see? but um, what's interesting about this is that whale, so we paid about $60,000 of room tax money to have that whale erected, and we knew it was temporary. But the cool thing is last week someone came to my office, and they are from Atlanta, and they want to invest about $2 million um, into an art project, which is super cool. That and is that very cool. is because they saw the whale on Instagram. That's a big deal. So you That's never know deal. what can yeah. happen. Oh, yeah. Right? It's all, of, it's right? all about. OK, are, are you cutting us off yet? Who, who am I supposed to look at here? <laughs> we, yes, we don't want to. We don't want to bore you anymore. We don't want to overstay but, our welcome. But one but thing that you talk about, you want more food culture in your city, right? Absolutely. Okay, we, so uh, I'm going to brag about my food culture. Yes. And there's um, someone. I think he's he's up next. Is he up next? Um, his We're name is Mark Esty. I'm really excited for you guys to meet him and have his food. You're going to love him. He's fantastic and dynamic. Mark, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Mark. <laughs> anyway, thank way. you so much. Enjoy Reno. Thank you all. And, and um, have a great time while you're here. Thank you. All right. Good job. Good job, Mayor. Good, Good job. Good job. <laughs> Every, everyone's hiding. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank great, you, great job. Right. I won't manhug you. <laughs> or mug you. Uh, so, so we, we talked about art. We've talked about uh, politics and, and culture and being, you know, the culture of yes and making it happen. So now we're going to turn to food. And as you've just, you've just heard an intro to the, to the next gentleman, gentleman on stage, but he's going to be talking about what it's like to be an entrepreneur in food and the importance of creativity. So please welcome Mark Esty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, welcome to Reno. And I uh, see a lot of familiar faces out there, and uh, we're really excited you're here. And I want to thank Robert. Uh, maybe about almost two years ago, Robert Goldberg said, I started talking to him about something in the restaurant. He, uh, I told him a story about this uh, feeling of entrepreneurialism and what I'm seeing in the industry right now with food and beverage and chefs and restaurant owners moving out of cities and where they were settling and moving into. And he says, you know what, that sounds so good. I'm going to put you up at a conference I'm putting on. And here we are. So Robert, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We're glad you brought the conference here. Um, food and beverage is easy. I'm sure everybody out there has favorite food favorite restaurants, favorite chefs, favorite bars, favorite things to eat. Maybe they're in your hometowns. Maybe they're traveling spaces and you travel over to Paris or you travel over to Noma or you go to French Laundry and a, a bunch of great places. But I don't think 10, 20 years, definitely not 20 years ago, but maybe 10 years ago, people even cared where their food came from, never mind who was cooking it, right? I think everyone thought it was kind of the Jetsons. You pressed a button, out came the Caesar salad with chicken, right? Out came the creme brulee and you were done. Uh, I think definitely over the last 20 years, we've started to move that way. Alice Waters was a pioneer of finding out people, where does your food come from? How come you don't know where it comes from? What are you eating? What are you putting in your body? A lot of good reasons, right? Keeping the, keeping the money local where you're from. Um, less far, carbon footprint, before that was a big word. Um, and finding out how to keep uh, the people around you employed and, 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 having a, and having a good time in their jobs. So I went to work for Alice Waters uh, about 18 years ago. Three weeks, stage, free work. 
spent three weeks peeling fava beans. And on the last day, fava beans, yes. And on the last day there, I was having lunch um, as my reward for working for free for three weeks. And uh, she, she came up to me and said, oh, thanks. I heard you in the kitchen. I appreciate it. She says, where are you from? I said, Reno Tahoe. She goes, where do you get your produce from? I said, produce guy. She's like, you don't have any farms up there? I said, I don't know. She said, why not? Okay, so she continues, right? Steak, fish, poultry. And every question I said, I don't know. And she said, why not? So I left, started crying, uh, got on the phone, <laughs> called and started asked the question, where, where the hell is there any farmers around here in Reno and Lake Tahoe? And there's a lot of great restaurants around here, and they have been for a long time. A lot of great casinos in our area. A lot of great restaurants with beautiful views. And um, I think we might have been a little late to the game and getting started, but right now we're on a roll. Reno's got a lot of good things going on right now, as does Tahoe. So what I've seen and what the story was I shared with Robert was uh, I do a lot of reading, right? So we live, I'm, from, I'm from Boston originally, uh, which is a, a great city, but I left Boston in 96 because there wasn't that many great restaurants there at that time, I'm trying to get to San Francisco or New Orleans. So I ended up, it was worth, with the Hyatt, and I ended up kind of in Lake Tahoe, which I didn't even know where it was. So we uh, come out here and we open up, we, we start working and open up a bunch of different restaurants over the years. Um, some great successes, some hurt a little bit more than others. And one of the things that we noticed was as I started opening restaurants, I became an entrepreneur because I'm just a dishwasher. And most chefs and a lot of people who start up their own businesses start at the lowest part and work your way up. I mean, I think that's really important. If you get to start at the top, that's great too. Uh, but for me, we started seeing um, different opportunities come up. So maybe we wanted to go to San Francisco, but something popped here in, in Truckee. So we said, let's, let's open a restaurant in Truckee. And we started to do, we didn't really know, right? We didn't know what we were doing. We just were dishwashers, making French fries, having a good time. Definitely having a good time. That's one of the things that food and beverage is so fun for. Um, but you can start to see how chefs uh, started uh, opening restaurants. And then the Food Network comes on, right? So now we're less than 10 years ago, if you really think about it, less than 10 years ago, Food Network comes onto the scene, shows become popular, chefs become entrepreneurs, restaurateurs, they become brands, celebrities, they become rich, they become famous, they also become crazy, they become broke, they become all the, all the great things that we all ride that wave together, you know? And maybe the only difference from our world is we get to do that while having a cocktail in our hand maybe and eating a good steak, right? So uh, all these chefs and restaurateurs, you know, they start going from these big cities where when I was in culinary school back in 93, 91 and 2, um, we had to go to San Francisco, we had to go to New York City, we had to go to Chicago, we had to go to um, New Orleans to work in these great, great restaurants because that's the only place they were. All of a sudden, you start fast forward it, right? Now you're five, ten years ago and rest chefs are leaving the big cities and they, they, they made their bones on the great chefs and they came back out and they came home, whether they're from Reno or they're from Boise, Idaho, or they're from Portland, or they're from Austin. And now you start to see what I'm going to call second-tier cities, because these places didn't have great, they weren't known for great cuisine. They start proliferating great, amazing restaurants. And then what follows that, right? So you have restaurants, you have bars. It's great to say you like to think art comes, with big, uh, art comes along with that, and commerce with retail stuff. But entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs start going out there, and you start leaving maybe the bigger cities or Silicon Valley or other places where all you smart people congregate to like make great things that happen in the world. You come into our, the smaller cities because why? Well, you can find a great university like UNR and you can work closely with the UNR. You find different things like, right? Thank you, shout out to UNR back there, Harvard on the Hill. Uh, you find great things like you find help. You find places that have affordability and you find you're like 45 minutes from Lake Tahoe and now our airport here can travel anywhere. I think they're like, I saw something about you can get to Palo Alto from here really soon. You know, there's a lot of cool things going on here in smaller cities. And one of the things is what we love in the restaurants is if you make a mistake, it might not be a $5 million mistake, right, building a restaurant, because sometimes that's what they cost. It might only be a little bit less than that, right? So you start to sign to see the fact that you have a little bit of an ability to, to put a little more risk out there. You have a little ability to service a, a bigger uh, clientele that's coming out and enjoys the smallness. You get to see those chefs. You get to meet those restaurant people, right? So you're, as your startups moved out here and successful people with incubating companies and successful companies running, uh, setting up shop, these cities became more and more sustainable, more and more viable. And the first restaurant, the first goal of a sustainable restaurant, anyone know? Yeah, keep the doors open, right? That would be the most important thing. So, so we think to ourselves... Um, we think these slower cities have offered a huge quality of life. Uh, they've offered a lot of great opportunities. 
And now you start to see even other cities kind of coming on. So other people have come in and they've worked. And now everyone wants to open their own restaurant. Everyone wants to work for a great place to have their own restaurant. And I think that is the most amazing thing in the world. We've taken something that used to be funny. When I said I was going to culinary school, everyone looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, you're going to do what? Why would you ever do that? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just kind of drawn to it. And here we are. And, uh, you know, a dishwasher to a restaurant owner. And really the, the greatest thing about it is, is we can all kind of walk hand in hand with entrepreneurs, you know, and I'm not nearly as smart and have a kind of acumen, but what we do is really important. And the fact that we can serve all of you and we feel that you're welcome to our city, it makes it a really fun thing for us to do. So we're excited you're here. I'm grateful you're here. Thank you, sir. All right. Wow, big round of applause for Mark. Woo! Yeah. So the, the food and drink you've been having is coming from Mark, and so that brings us to the close of the, the content uh, this evening, but just to, to let you know, so we've got the dine around sign-ups. If you haven't signed up downstairs, you can still do it. That's going to start from like 7.30. We're going to start it at 7, but we're starting at 7.30, running a little late now, so you can go to one of those restaurants, one of which is Mark's restaurants on that list that you can actually sign up for. Um, but there's a number of other restaurants in this area that we're going to actually now convene, convene at. And then there's after hours. I think there's actually a slide there. Uh, after hours reception, 1864 Tavern, 290 California Avenue. It's right, it's right here, right? That way, okay? So uh, looking forward to seeing you there and then tomorrow morning for, for a lot of great stuff. Look, looking forward to seeing you all. Oh, say it loud. Oh, oh yeah. So, so you can see um, the... Um, the galleries and so on until 7.30 here. So you can actually uh, enjoy your reception, and I'll join you and, and look at the art before you leave. Thank you. <laughs>